طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Welcome dear colleagues and dear respected speakers to the ORL webinar Our webinar tonight is a little bit different because we are bringing from uh, every part in the world one very brilliant uh, eminent speaker in the ORL who is going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 especially in the war speciality related to the area that he is from or he is working in, okay? So we are going to start with Dr. Hussam Al Amoudi. Dr. Hussam Al Amoudi will talk about the impact of COVID-19 in Saudi Arabia on ORL speciality. Uh, MashaAllah, we have many speakers and the time frame for every speaker will be very limited. So as we used to, uh, to say kindly, write all your question in the uh, Q&A box, the question and answer box. If you have anything related to technical issue, our sound, our slide, something like this, try to write it in the chat box. So without any further delay, I will ask Dr. Hossam to start his presentation. And as we used to, we will have all the questions at the end of the webinar. At the end of the webinar, again, I'm going to talk about the uh, CME point because I know this is a very hot topic that you are asking me every time. So I will highlight again the CME and who is going to uh, يعني, uh, get CME point for this webinar. Now, Dr. Hussam will start. Okay, uh, my name is Dr. Hussam Amoudi. I'm one of the ENT here in uh, Faqi Hospital in uh, Jeddah. And uh, as Dr. Bessant uh, started uh, the, the webinar, we are talking today about the impact of COVID-19 um, in um, different uh, parts of the world. And I will be talking about uh, mainly in Jeddah. Um, so uh, let's start with uh, some introduction and some uh, facts. As we all know, uh, late last year, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, started in Wuhan uh, in China. And as we all know as well, uh, it's a very highly contagious uh, zoonosis uh, virus with a reproductive number of around 2.8, which means the infection from one person to spread to 2.8 uh, relatively uh, in a very short time. And also we know that the spread from human to human largely by respiratory uh, secretions and some study showing some occasionally by feces. The infection is very highly infectious or the infectious. Uh, over a few weeks, the illness spread uh, to other parts of uh, Asia, and then from there uh, to Europe, North America, South America, and in, uh, in no time was all around uh, the world. Um, some important statistics, the infections occurred mainly uh, in elderly uh, individuals uh, or um, older than 30, uh, up to 80, uh, most of the infections. And most of the time, it produces very minor uh, upper respiratory tract symptoms in around 81%. It could be completely asymptomatic. Um, in around 15%, the infection produced severe infection enough to get the patient to the hospital. Um, requiring respiratory support in around 4%, and most of those are elderly with comorbidities such as uh, coronary artery disease, hypertension, and diabetes. The mortality rate uh, rough around between 0.4% to 4%, uh, and mortality rate uh, much higher among patients requiring mechanical ventilation, which again range between 15% to 50%, and some statistics from other hospitals actually up to 70 or 80 percent once the patient is ventilated. Some of the Wuhan statistics uh, show that health workers represent around 4 percent of all the infections, and 15 percent of those infections were considered severe, and overall mortality rate uh, among health workers is around 0.6 percent. The most commonly infected uh, healthcare worker were who worked in a general uh, words uh, with contact with COVID-19 patients. The not uh, very good news is the first reported physician fatality in this uh, pandemic in China was actually an EMT, autoreneurologist who died in January 25th. 
Um, healthcare uh, personnel um, or healthcare professional that manage patients with disease of upper, uh, upper digestive tract are the most susceptible to become infected. Therefore, it was rapidly recognized that there is a particularly need for protective measures in those professional groups. And ENT, of course, was one of them. Um, as an ENT, we perform potentially risky procedures, especially with uh, potential uh, secretions exposures, such as nasolaryngoscopy, endotracheal intubation, um, non-invasive ventilation, as well as transnasal endoscopic surgery. The good news is one of the studies, uh, case series, reported that none of 41 health workers who had contacted uh, COVID-19 positive patients and employed standard protective personal equipment developed an infection. So this study suggests that rate of infection when standard measures are employed is considerably low. PPE definitely does work. This is another study of around 169 staff workers who work very close uh, contact with also potentially COVID patients in dental emergency in Wuhan in the middle of the pandemic, managed around more than 700 uh, patients emer with emergency dental procedure. And also all of them had uh, enough or uh, good uh, protective uh, personal equipment, and none of them had COVID-19 infection. Also confirming that effectiveness of the established um, controlled measures. Aiming to preserve and ensure staff and patient uh, safety, the U.S. Center for Disease Control recommends all elective and non-time sensitive non-urgent surgical procedure and admission but must be rescheduled as necessary. ENT physician were one of the first line defense during this pandemic. We all know that. We have to deal with suspected cases all the time. Uh, we had to perform airway digestive surgery. Uh, we performed tracheostomy for COVID-19 patients. So definitely was quite stressful, challenging time. It actually uh, it has uh, health-related stress, financial issues, as well as management-related uh, stress. So in the next few slides, I will talk about some statistics I was able to gather it from different hospitals, including uh, our hospital. So when it comes to faculty care, um, OPD manpower in our department decreased to around 25, 25%, especially during the, the, uh, the main three months between um, around April, May, and June. Phoniatric service were completely stopped. Audiology clinic dropped by 50%. Uh, virtual clinics were adopted by all specialties, including ENT. Uh, OR general utilization dropped to less than 35%. At some point, it was around 25%. And major OR cases were affected due to ICU bed availability. Uh, PPE regular regulation was uh, applied uh, regularly. Uh, COVID-19 tracheostomies were done mainly by ENT. And COVID-19 uh, infection in the department uh, we had only two infections in our department, uh, the, our residents, uh, and one of the specialists uh, got the COVID-19 infection. None of the consultants had an infection. Um, some data from our fan hospital, uh, OPD or ENT, uh, including ENT and the audiology manpower, also uh, kind of decreased by 25%. Uh, so if the physician have 40 hours uh, working per week, it dropped to 30%. Phoniatric clinic is the only clinic offered virtual uh, clinics. OR, uh, OR utilization also dropped quite significantly during that period. In addition to uh, PPE regulation uh, was applied regularly uh, and no COVID-19 infection in the department of ENT in Erfan Hospital. Now we move to uh, public hospital or governmental hospital. Uh, National Guard Hospital was actually one of the impressive uh, hospitals in terms of protocols. Um, OPD were all virtual uh, from mid-March till actually recently when it started gradually opening again. Uh, OR general utilization dropped from 87% to only 15%, mainly doing 
uh, emergency and, uh, um, and oncology procedures. Um, day surgery, which is elective procedure, was completely almost stopped for six months, almost till mid-September. And also major OR cases, including oncology cases, were also affected by ICU availability, since most ICU dealt with COVID-19 patients. Um, interestingly, they have two rooms in the OR dedicated for only COVID-19 procedures. Um, and swabbing were all done for any elective procedure, again, including the oncological procedure. Um, King Fahad Armed Hospital, uh, similar kind of approach. They stopped all uh, OPD uh, outpatients. I just got this number from them. So they have around, or they used to see around uh, or close to 3,000 patients a month. Um, virtual clinic also adopted in uh, the center. Um, all elective cases were uh, postponed or canceled. They only worked uh, for emergency and oncology cases. Two and we have, yes? Two minutes. Two minutes, good. Thank you. No COVID-19 patients uh, also were reported in the Department of ENT in the hospital. Uh, King Abdelaziz University Hospital, uh, OPD clinic decreased by 50%. So if someone has, let's say, two clinics a week, it will drop to one. No virtual clinic. All elective cases were canceled since uh, March to September, which again, six months. They only did uh, emergency and oncology cases. COVID-19, there was three COVID-19 ENT um, infections. Uh, King Fahad General Hospital, uh, they have the similar kind of approach. Uh, also, they have no OPD. All elective cases were uh, postponed. Cochlear implant, which is the largest cochlear implant program in Jeddah or the uh, Western region, was also postponed till today. Um, COVID-19 trichostomy were done by ORL and sometimes ICU. They also have two uh, ENT residents infected with COVID-19. Uh, East Jeddah General Hospital, uh, same. Uh, they have another also two specialists. Um, infected uh, with COVID-19. Um, interestingly, the trichostomy were done only by ICU and never by uh, ENT departments. So, just putting some in perspective, uh, if you look at those uh, few hospitals in Jeddah, we are looking at at least 1,000 or more elective cases were postponed for a few months. So, in, in private hospital, probably only much less number were postponed for a couple of months, but in the uh, governmental hospital, we're looking at really big backlog that we have to face at some point in the near future, and we already started facing these issues. So, no question that COVID pandemic has a significant impact on ENT in our city, as it probably impacted every ENT around the world in probably different ways. So data showed clearly a big difference between private and government hospitals and how they dealt with uh, during this pandemic, obviously for obvious reasons. Residency training program in Jeddah was clearly affected by this drop in surgeries and clinics. Um, physicians, ENT or different or non-ENT ha have to deal with the psychological, financial and professional consequences. And in the near, again, in the, in the near future, we have to deal with a lot of backlog of uh, patients and surgeries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shukran, Dr. Hossein. Now let's move to our next speaker, Dr. Ahmed Abu Saud. Dr. Hossein, you can stop sharing the screen by the end. Shukran. Dr. Ahmed Abu Saud. Yes. He is from uh, USA. Of course, he is going to talk about who, sorry, he is working in USA, and of course, he is going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 in USA on ORL specialty. Father, doctor. Okay. I think you have a chair. You have the screen now? Yes. Father. اوكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم انا اسمي دكتور احمد ابو سعود انا اصلا من الاردن so do we have english speaking here attendees or all the attendees speaks arabic لا يا دكتور we have uh, uh, non arabic uh, attendees okay no 
Okay, no problem. So I'm Dr. Ahmed Abu Saud. I'm from Jordan. Um, I graduated from Egypt, worked in Australia for one year, completed my ENT training in Qatar at Hamad Medical Corporation. Uh, uh, I completed two years um, a rhinology fellowship at Union Memorial Hospital in Maryland, and I'm currently doing pediatric ENT fellowship at University of Tennessee. Um, so uh, I, since I'm in the States and uh, the Americans like the statistics and the studies, so I'm going to uh, share with you um, the statistics that I've obtained from the uh, practice that I used to work at last year, last academic year. So uh, I used to work at an ENT private practice who had an agreement with two medical systems. Uh, so we used to cover uh, life bridge and MedStar medical system. Uh, when I was a fellow, uh, rhinology fellow last year, I used to cover five hospitals, um, um, uh, Union Memorial Hospital, Good Samaritan, Sinai, and two other hospitals over the phone. So we used to cover the uh, emergency inpatient and outpatient consultations. Uh, our ENT department uh, um, uh, was formed from three attendings, two fellows. Uh, unfortunately, we did not have ENT residents. However, we used to have internal medicine, general surgery, and these residents uh, helping us to cover the service. So uh, the ENT, as I told you, we used to cover five hospitals. We used to have four clinics, four ENT clinics, three out of them uh, based, located in the hospitals and one outside the hospital. We used to operate in four ORs, two uh, in the hospitals, and two small surgery center, centers of the, outside the hospital. So this, is, this diagram shows the numbers of ENT visits. Uh, uh, for our practice. So if you look to the diagram, I included January, February, April, and May. So January, February, that was before the pandemic, and April, May, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you look to January statistics, so we, uh, during January 2020, we have seen more than 1,500 patients or 400 patients uh, in the clinic and in the OR. Uh, February, a little bit more, around 1,600 patients. If you look to April and May, the number of ENT visits dropped significantly um, to more than 60%. So in April, we've seen only 600 patients, and, we had, and in May, we had like around 650 uh, follow-ups. Um, before the pandemic, uh, we did not have the televisit service, uh, we, uh, but because of the situation, and um, we had to establish the service. Uh, so if you look to the diagram, January and February, we had a zero televisits. However, in April, after we established the service, we started to have um, uh, patients to uh, see them virtually, which is not that efficient in ENT. Uh, so we had 85 televisits in April, and we had around 65 uh, during May. Personally, the, this is my photo. I got the infection, and that was early in, pandem in the pandemic in March, and it was a really bad infection. Uh, I'm still 35 years old, healthy, uh, but this is telling you that we are at high risk of getting the infection, uh, especially uh, that in ENT we deal with the secretions, we deal... We examined the patient from zero distance, so uh, even if you're still young, healthy, you have to take all the protective measures uh, because you are at high risk. Um, so uh, since I'm still trainee and still I'm doing my fellowship uh, at University of Tennessee, so I pulled these three studies from uh, uh, PubMed, uh, the first study talking about the impact of COVID-19 on uh, pediatric fellowship uh, training. So the method of that study, um, so they sent like a questionnaire, 24 uh, uh, consists from 24 questions uh, to all uh, the program directors in the states, um, to all the pediatric otolaryngology fellowship uh, program directors. Uh, so the um, the response rate for the um, uh, 
for the questionnaire was around 61 percent, uh, 22 uh, program director out of 36 responded, and 77 percent of them uh, they reported that yes, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, had uh, a significant uh, negative impact on the uh, training. And what, when I say training here, I mean by the surgical training and by the clinical or by the education training. Uh, 86% of the fellowship directors reported that, uh, yes, they are still performing some procedures because most of the fellowships are at a big tertiary hospital, so they cannot stop the surgeries. However, the volume of the uh, surgery um, dropped significantly, and this, is, of course, negatively impacted the training. Um, around 13%, and this is very interesting, uh, of the fellowship directors reported that uh, they had to pull their fellows out of the program and to send them to uh, COVID-19 service. Uh, and this is not only an ENT. I, I have a lot of friends in different specialties, um, medicine, oncology, pediatric. Uh, they have to uh, pull them from their uh, training, either, or the, either residency or fellowship training, and to send them to cover the COVID-19 uh, service. Um, and that was especially, um, uh, and that was happened in, maybe in April. So another study here uh, talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the um, uh, trainee education, not only the fellows, uh, but the residents. And this time uh, they send a survey or the questionnaire uh, to the residents uh, at, uh, in North America. Uh, so out of 216 um, residents, 83% uh, completed the survey and 98% um, saying that, yes, the COVID-19 uh, negatively impacted their training. And 54% uh, of the senior trainees felt unsecure about the job opportunities, either the fellowship or the uh, uh, faculty positions uh, after they complete their training. Uh, because most of the hospitals here, um, um, the big uh, medical uh, systems, they stopped uh, recruiting. And a lot of them, um, I'm not sure if you're guys familiar with the uh, uh, US medical system, how it's run. Uh, so a lot of them, they uh, even uh, reduced the salaries of most of the uh, medical staff, 20%, 30%, some of them 40%. And they had to lie off some of the um, non-essential medical workers. So there were like many, many papers and recommendations uh, published uh, through the academy or outside the academy about the uh, practical recommendation for otolaryngologists, uh, otolaryngologists in dealing with the COVID-19 patients. And the recommendation mainly was to avoid seeing any uh, elective uh, patients either in the clinic or in the OR and to switch to the virtual uh, or to the televisits. For the emergency cases, uh, the recommendation, uh, especially in the mucosa-related um, uh, uh, procedures, which is the ENT, most of the ENT procedures, they recommend to use all the protective uh, and enhanced uh, PPE, uh, like the N95 uh, masks, for, uh, the mask uh, shield, uh, the air purifying respirators, um, different types of gloves, surgical caps, gowns, uh, shoes covers, uh, for the urgent surgeries, and they've changed this policy multiple times. Uh, for the urgent surgeries that cannot wait, um, every hospital uh, uh, was asked by the academy to have um, uh, negative pressure rooms and to have um, um, a special filtration system uh, for this type of surgeries. For the less urgent surgeries, the policy was to do a two COVID-19 test for the patient 48 hours and 24 hours uh, before the surgery, and not to go for the, the surgery unless uh, that you get two negative uh, uh, results. Now, uh, when, when I moved to Tennessee, yes. Two minutes, second. I'm, I'm almost done. Okay. 
when I moved to Tennessee here uh, to Memphis, uh, so um, the policy was to have uh, for the elective surgeries in particular to have a negative uh, COVID-19 test for uh, the patient and should be within three days of the date of the surgery. Now they started to do that and they, uh, they ask only for a negative COVID-19 test to be uh, within seven days of the date of the surgery. So uh, we go, uh, I mean, so they are uh, reducing uh, the majors and the restrictions uh, and we started to see more number uh, the number of uh, COVID-19 cases to rise. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Now let's Thank move you. to Doctor Ahmed Bahiri. Doctor Ahmed, stop sharing screen. I shall Doctor Mahmoud Yahud the screen and Hadrata. Doctor Mahmoud Bahiri he is working in UK. So he is going to cover this part in the world to talk about the impact of COVID-19 in UK on ORL speciality. ممكن هنعمل ايه؟ هنطلع تاني تفتح السكرين وبعد كده وتعمل لها شير. على مهلك خالص. تمام. وضحت يا فندم. هنكبر بس السكرين بعد اذنك. تمام. يلا جود لك يا فندم بالتوفيق. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I am uh, Dr. Mahmoud Bahiri. Um, I have been working here in the UK about uh, one year and a half at the moment. I have been working in uh, uh, Dr. Suman Faqhi about seven years ago. And uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, impact of COVID-19 on ONT speciality in the UK. And during the coronavirus um, crazy moments, we are um, just saying and speaking about a new term, what's called the personal protective equipment. Uh, this equipment is including um, surgical mask and single-use disposable apron, gloves and eye protection. And every physician or specifically ENT doctor uh, should have this protective measure, especially uh, while we are doing examination um, with a flexible or epidural endoscopy. And if you are dealing with COVID-19 patient, you should wear a PVC mask. This is very important. Uh, during uh, the COVID-19 era, um, all elective ENT procedure uh, could be postponed uh, unless it is very urgent cases like pediatric airway or head and neck cancer. During the escalation in COVID-19, uh, we should be caref careful prioritization about to select the cases uh, according to the staff uh, numbers and the theater uh, space as well. And if there is any further escalation, uh, the result will be cancellation of all elective surgery to utilize space and staff for looking after critically ill patients. During our working in the UK, all outpatient clinics was postponed and was um, converted to what we call the telephone consultation or telemed consultation. So we are dealing with the patient through, uh, through the phone and only we are dealing with uh, the critically ill patient and urgent patient through face-to-face -face consultation and uh, very important to have a PPE uh, where required. I'm just uh, take a, a rapid review about uh, every specialty. So during the autology and starting with the mastoid surgery, we are not doing any mastoid surgery during coronavirus uh, due to the risk of uh, catching infection because there is an evidence of coronavirus in the epithelium of the middle ear during upper respiratory tract infection. We are just 
uh, using uh, the microscope during uh, doing uh, this mastectomy uh, operation. And uh, we all know that the microscope may offer some degree of eye protection during drilling of the bone in the mastoid area, uh, but this drilling should be kept as minimum as possible. And if possible, the surgeon should continue to wear eye protection while uh, um, have a look uh, during microscope. Uh, this is um, like a study uh, at Harvard Medical School. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is what we call a fluorescein. This is a fluorescein dye over the mastoid area. And you can see here that droplets of uh, the drilling of bone uh, in the surgeon gown and also in uh, the uh, physician advisor. So this is very risk operation. We are just doing the mastoidectomy only uh, if there is acute mastoiditis and mastoid abscess, and if there is any intracranial sepsis or temporal bone malignancy only. Other otologic uh, procedure uh, should be postponed uh, unless uh, the patient doesn't have any uh, COVID uh, active or COVID positive. And only urgent cases uh, like uh, biopsy of suspected neoplasm uh, should be uh, seen uh, as easy as possible. Uh, also during the vestibular schwannoma surgery, uh, we are not dealing with uh, vestibular schwannoma surgery at all unless there is life threatening uh, brainstem compression. And also, when we choose between um, the approach, we are just to choose the retrosubmoid one, not the transalapinacine, um, to minimize the drill time and also exposure to middle ear mucosa. Also, using of steroid during uh, the coronavirus, um, we are not recommended to use a steroid, especially for the high dose. Um, as we know that we are using a steroid with a near disease, sudden sensory loss, idiopathic facial palsy, and of this high dose of steroid, uh, we are using intratympanic steroid injection. Regarding the head and neck uh, region, we are dealing with oral referral as a triage. Triage means that we are dealing with every patient and we are seeing the condition with the referral letter. If there is any urgency to see this patient, we can see it as early as possible with full PPE uh, through face-to-face -face consultation. Uh, unless if there is no urgency, we will just do telephone consultation, maybe after four weeks, up to six weeks. And we can review if there is any uh, other uh, cases couldn't be seen at the moment. We could, we could postpone for maybe six months or nine months. Also, we are uh, doing some restriction of diagnostic workup at the moment because of the coronavirus uh, to have a space uh, to um, uh, also for the MRI and CT scan. Uh, for dealing with uh, COVID-19 patient during the ICU. MDT uh, meeting as well, uh, we are minimized the number of personnel to one surgeon, only one uh, clinical oncologist and one radiologist and one pathologist as well. Uh, all other stuff can be uh, attended like virtually. And also we are discussing only the very urgent um, cases, not the common ones. Treatment as well, uh, we are just treating with uh, the thyroid cancer uh, surgery. We are doing only wide local excision without reconstruction. Also, during the surgical procedure requiring post-operative ICU, uh, we just restrict this surgical just to have a space uh, to the staff of the ICU to concentrate, also reducing the length of the surgery. Other than uh, non-surgical examples, we can uh, postpone the chemo radiotherapy in favor of radiotherapy alone. All follow-up uh, will be uh, uh, attended like phone consultation, uh, maybe after uh, six to nine months uh, after evaluation of uh, the notes of the patient. Uh, during rhinology, uh, we have uh, two major uh, different during COVID. The first one is epistaxis, as we may know that uh, when we deal with the abstracted patient, uh, we have a proper clinical examination and we can do uh, what we call the silver nitrate cauterization. Uh, during uh, COVID-19, we are not doing a clinical examination at all or cauterization of the nose. We will just put in uh, anterior uh, nasal back like rapid rhino. And uh, if the patient can send home and we can review the same, that will be very helpful. Also, uh, if we have a patient with a new onset anosmia, uh, we are not dealing with anosmia uh, for the first six weeks. It will be with the GP 
and uh, through only telephone consultation. And if there is any other nasal symptoms, uh, we should see this patient with doing nasal endoscopy. And this, if there is nasal endoscopy is normal, we request only MRI. But we are not doing any imaging for any patient with isolated onset uh, anosmia without any other symptoms at the moment. Uh, tracheostomy care during uh, COVID-19, uh, this is very important. Uh, and uh, during um, uh, there is a, any reversible cause of airway obstruction, we just in favor to do intubation rather than the tracheostomy. And if we can do the tracheostomy, uh, so we will uh, pick the most skilled anesthetic and, and, assist, and also the most uh, skilled ENT uh, doctor to do it. Also, uh, that elective tracheostomy, we should have a full PPE. This is very important uh, to prevent spread of infection to the physician. And also preparation and gowning uh, during tracheostomy, this is very important to have FFB3 mask and face protection and disposable gown as well. And we should uh, we should try to have it covered an unfinished tracheostomy tube. And we do every effort should be made not to ventilate until we have a tracheostomy tube and to be sure that the cuff is inflated uh, and also the HME should be placed on the tracheostomy to reduce the shedding of the virus. Uh, post tracheostomy, are you on the floor? Okay, so post tracheostomy care. So um, now we are um, doing changing tracheostomy cube during COVID. We are not changing the tracheostomy at the moment. Um, also, nasal endoscopy is very important to have a full PPE, uh, especially in the clinic where, when you are um, examining the patient. Uh, also, uh, there is some theater challenges at the moment. Uh, as you may know that we are now having full PPE, so there is extremely challenging, and you have to raise your voice in order to hear uh, through the mask. And also, um, at one time, you can stamp in your foot in order to catch the anesthesia's uh, attention. And also the operating time, it will um, increase by about 25% of any procedure at the moment. And it's impossible to take a phone call while it's in full PPE. And at the end of any procedure uh, during surgery, there is naturally a strong desire to leave the theater as soon as possible. And also it's very important to plan your surgery uh, while prepping the surgery uh, to have to don't have any missing any time, and also it is likely that as a result of staff sickness and unfilled PPE training, you may find yourself working with a team less experienced than your usual colleague in the procedure you are undertaking. This is a challenging moment, and we are all um, have a great impact with that. Thank you so much. Shukran, Thank you very much. Uh, now let's move to uh, Dr. Firas Zawi. Dr. Firas, he is going to talk about the impact in Jordan. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud, you can stop sharing screen. Dr. Firas. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, to start with, um, um, I'm going to uh, show you um, a few slides about the impact of COVID-19 on uh, ENT practice in Jordan. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm Firas al -Zabi. I'm professor of ENT at uh, Jordan University of Science and Technology, um, and currently working also uh, at Yarmouk University in Erbid, uh, north of Jordan. Um, I'm mainly um, doing a lot of autology surgery and um, with, with um, endoscopic sinus surgery. So, um, so the objectives of this talk, will uh, I'm going to talk about Jordan response to the pandemic, uh, to understand how the pandemic affected uh, Jordan in general, and to provide an overview of the impact of the pandemic on ENT practice in Jordan. Um, I'm not going to talk uh, more about um, uh, why um, uh, COVID-19 is a global health crisis and um, affecting mainly otolaryngologists, but a uh, few things about uh, the high viral load and why do we need to be uh, very careful in dealing with patients because, because we are dealing mainly with, with um, 
uh, upper uh, airway with with high viral load. So the risk is, is very high for for all the ANT um, team. Um, and as, as um, my colleague mentioned, the first physician deaths were otolaryngologists in Wuhan in China. So uh, regarding Jordan, um, Jordan, um, the first COVID-19 infected individual was identified on the 2nd of March, 2020. And on the uh, uh, 16th of March, the Jordanian government announced a full lockdown uh, with the closure of schools and universities and with subsequent, uh, um, subsequent affection of all uh, sectors. Um, Jordan became the first out of 13 countries in the world that had the highest government response uh, uh, stringency. Uh, in fact, Jordan was the first country in the world to attain perfect score, 100 over 100 on the stringency score index and sustained the score for 34 days. This has uh, some, some uh, excellent outcome, but also some, some negative and some drawbacks. So this is um, the diagram showing um, the response with, with the cases. And um, 16th of March with the lockdown, this is the, um, a strong response from the government with, with complete uh, strict regulations. Um, following the, the lockdown, the Jordan government enforced public health infection prevention and control measures called for social distancing, ceased all forms of inbound and outbound movement and international travel, uh, enacted the defense law that transferred the authority to the Minister of Defense to work and formulate orders according to the situation. Uh, it has got a very strong uh, rules regarding the, the the prevention and, and controlling of this pandemic. The aim was to accelerate contain, uh, containment of the disease to protect the economy and maintain continuity of some activities um, with, with the effect uh, uh, on social, economic, and financial impact. Uh, we want the, the government aimed to, to decrease the impact. But unfortunately, the resulting eco economic burden has placed the country on the verge of collapse because during the first two months with complete lockdown, a lot of small businesses uh, suffered a lot. So this is the, the diagram showing um, the situation in Jordan. Uh, from, from, uh, from the beginning after the lockdown, and we have got very minimum cases of, of uh, pandemic. Actually, we didn't have the first uh, impact and the first wave of the disease because of this complete lockdown, where well, we had excellent response, but unfortunately, we, you can't isolate the country uh, completely because uh, it, it would be impossible to do that. And after that, we started to have many cases. Actually, we, what we did, what the government did is to postpone the, the first wave, and we started to have the wave recently with many, many cases. So what, what was the impact on ENT? The main threats to ENT clinical services were uh, that the ENT doctors were the main part of the epidemiological field investigation team. So this had to disrupt the care, uh, the care of the, the usual ENT practice. Many ENT doctors were transferred uh, to the field to, to participate in taking swabs and to uh, be part of, of the teams. To, uh, to try to isolate any suspected cases. Um, we had uh, many, uh, with, with, with the cases, you had to intubate and then you had to uh, uh, um, participate in doing some complex uh, uh, COVID-19 and airway problems. Uh, we had a reduced access to instrumental procedures according to the guidelines. Every, um, every case with, um, can wait should be postponed. We had some cases with delayed head and neck cancer diagnosis because of uh, the uh, reduced number of, of uh, clinics available. Um, and um, due to um, the fear, the public fear of, of the pandemic, they started to, uh, uh, um, to reduce the uh, visits to the, to the hospitals. Um, the workforce issues that affected the ENT and the redeployment, the impact on the current services, uh, a lot of, uh, of outpatient clinic was stopped 
da theater da theater da non emergency theater was also cancelled uh, it has got a training implication on the ENT uh, residents close um, cancellation of all non emergency and online teaching activities so a lot of hands on training was was stopped and um, this uh, this affected all the training for about 3 to uh, 6 months it has got a psychological impact on staff for long hour before uh, they were allowed to, to go home and after they were go uh, after they are going home they have to isolate themselves so it has got uh, many psychological impact um, with exposed to trauma uh, and, and faced moral dilemma of providing the best care uh, and high quality care with limited limited um, uh, resources um, there was post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety disorders, and sub uh, substance misuse due to lack of sleep and, and many other uh, problems. Um, unfortunately, uh, we had a lack of post-trauma social support and uh, uh, the exposure to stressors um, uh, affecting the, the um, uh, mental health status of, the, of the, all the medical teams, not only ENT. And these points were um, raised, and uh, uh, the government are working on them. The government is working on them. Um, so many uh, doctors and um, um, uh, staff, member of staff, um, they were put themselves in the danger, but they have got a good morale. So um, the answer is usually, why you put yourself in this risk? Uh, we must try our best. Um, uh, as, as we are at the front line, I fight for fa my family and fight for my society. This is my duty because I'm ENT physician, no matter what will happen. So there was a, a strong morale, but the support is needed for, uh, for the front line to keep providing that service. Um, unfortunately, also we have to um, tackle another point, which is the uh, impact on research. Um, a lot of research activities were limited because reduction of funding, um, very limited access to participants, um, and the inability to contact face-to-face -face instru instrumental assessment of the patient. Dr. Firaz? Yes. Two minutes, you can. Okay. So uh, what we learned from, from the pandemic, the, the initial in Jordan, um, that uh, the intensive work during the ENT team physically and emotionally. Uh, ENT showed their resonance to the spirit of professional dedication to overcome difficulties, but they need the support. We have to work very hard on the comprehensive model of dealing with this kind of pandemics. Um, we need a regular intensive training for all, their, uh, all healthcare uh, providers uh, to promote everything uh, and to uh, efficiently uh, uh, managing this crisis. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you please stop sharing screen by the ISNAC? Now let's move to our last speaker, Dr. Dirar Edomaidat. Dr. Dirar, he is going to talk about the COVID-19 and the acute olfactory loss. Again, let me remind you, uh, until Dr. Dirar will fix his uh, slide, that kindly for all that you want to ask, just write your question in the Q&A box, and we are going, inshallah, uh, immediately after the Dr. Dirar presentation to manage the uh, questions. Shukran. Dr. Dirar, Is my screen shown? Okay, thank you. At first, I would like to welcome everyone in the audience or the listeners, and a special greeting to Professor Firas Zobi, one of my mentors and supervisors during residency. So, assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Dirar al I work now as uh, a senior specialist in the Philippine Hospital. I will be talking now uh, about the COVID-19 and the acute olfactory loss. Okay. I would like uh, first to make a small uh, modification for the title of this uh, part of the webinar to make it olfactory dysfunction of coronavirus uh, COVID-19. Why? Because patients may complain not only of uh, uh, loss of smell, also may have, uh, for example, high 
hyperposmia or microsomia, which is reduced sensation of smith. Some of them will come from meaning of parasomia, saying that, doctor, I smell, but not the usual and the uh, actual uh, smells. Uh, some of them can complain of cacosmia. Doctor, I have severe bad smell, okay, for food or, for example, any, uh, any perfumes. Uh, some uh, come complaining of agusia, which means a uh, complete loss of taste. So at first, let's ask this question. Is this an important issue to talk about? And the answer is, of course, yes. The first, uh, the first reason is that olfactory loss can have severe devastating manifestations psychologically, okay, for the patient or for, or for all people. For example, we cannot uh, have flavor, okay, unless we have taste, uh, sorry, unless we have smell. Because smell makes uh, around 80% of the flavor. The second cause, okay, now in this era of COVID-19 pandemic, we are seeing huge numbers of patients coming to clinics complaining of loss of smell. Just as an instance, I, the first loss of the smell I saw here was in uh, March, okay, then in April, okay, we started to see patients complaining of loss of smell, okay, on a weekly basis. Then in uh, June and July on, on daily basis, okay? So this is now a big uh, issue to talk about. It's, it's, uh, it's open, okay? Okay, because in uh, the SARS, which uh, uh, rose uh, in 2003, okay, some of the autopsies showed that uh, there uh, were much viral load in the brain stem, okay, uh, in the brain some researchers that say now, uh, that COVID-19, okay, makes okay. viruses before COVID-19. Of course, as we know, COVID-19 is not the first virus which causes a loss of smell or olfactory dysfunction, okay? Because as we all know, uh, we have a term, okay, or a condition called post-viral olfactory disorder, okay? We have many viruses, okay, before COVID-19 which cause loss of smell. For example, rhinovirus, para-influenza virus, adenovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, and, and the old coronavirus also. But we have some differences between COVID-19, okay, as a cause of factory dysfunction, and uh, the uh, the other viruses as causes of post-viral olfactory disorder. First of which, COVID-19 has better has better prognosis for olfactory improvement and return. Before COVID-19, when patients came to us complaining of complete loss of the smell after viral infection, we said to them, we break bad news that unfortunately you may not get your Infection back, but in COVID-19, yes, this is not this is, this is not the case. the uh, the second cause. Okay, the second difference thing okay, is the COVID infections are not associated with other okay rhinological symptoms that we are used to see in patients coming with with post-viral uh, loss of the smell as other viruses such as uh, nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, itchiness, facial pain. Most of our patients came only loss of smell. A few of them, okay, in percentage, in 30, uh, 13, sorry, to 50 percent, came of nasal congestion only. No, okay, very minimal patients come complaining of uh, rhinorrhea, for example. Okay, and also there is a fantastic uh, the demographic distribution of loss of smell. For example, okay, in the, in the early papers which, uh, which came from uh, uh, East uh, Asia, for example, uh, China and uh, Singapore and uh, South uh, uh, Korea, okay, very few numbers complain of loss of smell. While in our region, in European regions, in the North America, many patients come complaining of loss of smell after COVID-19. How does this occur? <clears throat> How does this occur? How loss of smell and olfactory dysfunction occur? Here, as we see, we have the, the nasal cavity, okay? At the roof of the nasal cavity, we have the uh, uh, olfactory nerve, okay? We have this 
bony blade called called cribriform blade because it has four through which the olfactory nerves go to the bottom of the frontal lobe of the brain and makes the olfactory bulb which goes in posterior to the brain center of olfaction. Okay. Histological, okay. In histology, we have this, as we say, this is the roof of the nasal cavity. Here we have the neurological olfactory, olfactory neuro, uh, neuro, uh, olfactory neuroepithelium, olfactory neuroepithelium. This is uh, olfactory neuroepithelium. It contains a unmotile cilia, which contains receptors, okay, for uh, smell. And we have supporting cells here, and we have basal cells here, which, uh, why I'm, I am showing you this slide, okay, because these supporting cells, some of the basal cells are not shown here, okay, have much amount of S2 receptors, okay, have much amount, much concentration of S2 receptors, okay, as in addition to the, uh, the important, okay, protein, which is important for the entry of the virus into the, these cells, okay, which is transmembrane protein, uh, uh, series S2, okay, which is very important. The S2, as we know, it is highly concentrated in the lung tissue and also in the, in the oral cavity and also in these supporting cells and uh, and uh, basal cells, okay? So the first theory says that the virus gets entry into these cells and it damages, okay, these cells making, because, and these cells are, have very important function for these olfactory neuroreceptors. The second theory says, okay, how does olfactory loss or dysfunction happen? The virus comes to these receptors, okay, here on the cilia, and it destroys them. The virus destroy these receptors. The third theory says that we have inflammation, and inflammation, okay, will cause a layer, okay, as any inflammation, which prevents the access of the odor molecules into these cells. So we have three uh, theories which can explain, okay, uh, the how does this happen, okay? But we are not certain which actually happens. Okay, uh, moving to when does, okay, the timing of the loss of the smell in, 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 in COVID-19 patients, okay? We can, uh, patients may come complaining of loss of the smell or olfactory dysfunction before, okay, the onset of general symptoms, after the onset of general symptoms or simultaneously, okay, simultaneous to the uh, appearance of other COVID-19 symptoms, okay? In some of the studies, okay, it say that olfactory dysfunction is the first symptom in about a quarter of the patients who come with COVID-19 infection. And some studies say that 16 persons, okay, of patients come only with loss of the smell. 16 persons is not a small number. Okay. Now, moving to some numbers, some statistics, we have hundreds of, of researchers, okay, which talk about loss of the smell and COVID-19. I tried my best to choose the meta-analysis, okay, which uh, studied hundreds, okay, of the uh, these studies and researches. First of which we I I, I, I entitled here in my uh, seminar or webinar, okay. The first one is loss is loss of the sense of smell diagnostic mark in COVID-19 in system interview and meta-analysis, okay. So of course the cit citation is uh, is available if anyone uh, anyone wants to. Uh, this study said that about 62% of patients who have COVID-19, who have positive COVID-19 on positive, uh, uh, positive uh, PCR testing, okay, 62% of them, they have, they have loss of smell or olfactory dysfunction. And to, to, be, to speak more, uh, who, the patients who come with olfactory dysfunction, let's assume that a patient came to me, okay, a patient comes to me complaining of loss of smell, okay, then this patient has a positive predictive value of 61%, which means that this patient has a risk to be positive for COVID-19 in a percentage of 61. Imagine, okay, he has two-thirds risk to be positive for, for COVID-19. Before COVID-19, we say, go home, you have, you have post-viral, uh, loss of smell, okay, but now he has a uh, 61 risk to be positive for COVID-19 only if he comes with uh, olfactory dysfunction. 
Okay, and uh, this, in this study, okay, meta-analysis, it found that it is more uh, more associated with female gender. Than gender? Yes. One minute. One minute only? Okay, and another uh, study it found that, uh, meta-analysis found that it is uh, available in 85.6% of the people, okay, and it is mostly associated with people. Now I will talk about two uh, studies. Uh, I chose these two studies because it, uh, because the Dr. Nain and his team, okay, did uh, uh, an objective test. Okay, he used University of Pennsylvania smell test, which is a highly validated uh, forty odorant test. It is one of the mostly used objective tests to, to uh, measure smell. Okay, and it can also give us degrees of loss of smell, of the degree uh, of the uh, olfactory function life. Uh, is it normal smell, mild hyposmia, moderate hyposmia, or microsomia, severe, or complete anosmia, or is he malingering? So it is one of the mostly used objective tests for smell. Okay, the first of these uh, studies I will show you, okay, it showed that he, it, he tested about 60 inpatients, okay, here, and compared them with 60, okay, normal people. He found that about 80, uh, sorry, 98% okay, of these people who have severe infection, who, ha who are inpatients, okay, he found that most of them have severe microsomia. Severe microsomia. Imagine this number, huge number, 98%, okay? While the other control group, okay, was normal, okay? And also, okay, uh, uh, which means, okay, which means that we can use uh, a smell, okay, or this objective test, okay, as an early test and the treatment also for quarantine these patients. Uh, and another study to end with, uh, to end uh, with, okay, is, uh, a, is a different study by Dr. Main and also and his team, okay. This uh, study, okay, used a, 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 a cohort uh, study, okay, for also a group of people, okay, who have severe COVID-19, okay, and other normal people. He found that most of those people, okay, have severe microsomia, and he followed, okay, those patients, okay, over weeks. He repeated the Pennsylvania smell identification test. He found that with time, okay, with time, most people are going to improve, okay, uh, to about two thirds, okay, 61% of people, okay, who were mostly, okay, have some kind of olfactory function by the end of the eight weeks, okay, they, most of them have improved, okay, and almost none of them became hypo, uh, uh, sorry, became anosmic, okay, some about 17% of people were completely anosmic, have, have complete loss of smell at first, but after eight weeks, okay, none of them have complete anosmia. They improve. Okay. So uh, what also, uh, he, what's interesting also in this study is that only 28% of those tested people, okay, only 28% of those 100 COVID-19 patients know that, and knew that they have actual loss of the smell of olfactory dysfunction. To end up with the from message, okay, most patients with COVID-19, as we know, have mild or sometimes asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic uh, conditions, okay? Thus, it is very important, okay, to, to have an initial pathognomonic symptom and sign for all infections to help the preventing the spreading of this virus. For us as ENT doctors, we believe that olfactory dysfunction is the key feature in this issue to prevent the spread, okay, of this uh, uh, pandemic. And thank you so much. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Right. Now I will take uh, the first uh, question. I think the first question for Dr. Dirar, because it's written, the recent BMJ case report published the article regarding si uh, sudden honest of sincere hearing loss, SSNHL, followed COVID-19. What is the prevalence of, of this? in your patient population, and what is the indication of us starting using steroids? Let me okay. answer this question. I don't think so. It's actually one of the uh, Dr. Dorar's talk. Uh, one of the, uh, I see most of the sensitive hearing loss in our faculties. Uh, Maybe Dr. Faraz also can help, but I haven't seen any uh, sensory neural hearing loss 
in COVID-19 uh, patients. And uh, my practice is still the same. Uh, for non-COVID-19 patients, uh, I, start, I still treat uh, with uh, steroids, except if there is a contraindication, uh, such as diabetes, hypertension, and then I will treat with only intratympanic uh, steroids. But again, I have not seen any um, sensory hearing loss in COVID-19 patients. Uh, maybe Dr. Faraz also can add something if he see any uh, Actually, uh, such patients. I'm the same. I didn't have um, any any patients with uh, sensory neural hearing loss. Um, um, uh, it's only one one reported cases in uh, uh, British Medical Journal, but uh, I don't think uh, it could be a coincidence. So um, I, I don't have in my patients. So. Uh, could I add something? You have uh, something? For yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just revised uh, recently that there is some patients we have uh, sudden sensory neural hearing loss. And I saw over the last uh, three, four months at the moment that uh, we have every one month one patient with sudden sensory neural hearing loss. We are not um, changing the treatment of uh, um, the protocol for sudden sensory neural. We try to have intratympanic injection first, uh, and if it's not working, we are just giving the patient a uh, high dose of steroid. If if, if, if there is no any complication like diabetes or GIT problems, something like that. We, I'm seeing recently sudden sense of hearing loss, but it's not as far as anosmia or sense of smell change recently. Shukran, thank you. Any, anyone from our panel? Uh... Yeah, this question was for me regarding the use of the steroid in uh, anosmia. For me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as I say, okay, do not. Uh, there are many studies uh, says now, okay, not uh, that steroids at the beginning of the disease, okay, especially in my to moderate cases, it increased the mortality rate, steroids, okay? So never, never prescribe steroids for acute loss of smell for patients at, at the beginning of the disease, okay? If you want to try them, it's okay, but after, after, after the patient mentions other symptoms of the COVID-19, okay, because, because now there are many researchers say that uh, mild to moderate, okay, to use steroids, mild to moderate uh, uh, COVID-19 patients increase their mortality rate. But after the, uh, the cessation or the end of these symptoms, okay, if he has, he still has, uh, he, st if he still has uh, loss of smell, he can try steroids. Yes, of course. Shukran, yeah. Let's move to the next uh, question. Uh, for how long loss of smell it's always reversible. As I said, in the, in the, it, it depends according to uh, the uh, researchers, uh, actually. Some say that about 75% of people, okay, return back to their normal condition, okay, and about eight days after the, uh, the, uh, the course of the disease. Imagine eight days, okay. The, most of the researchers okay, are, are different, even meta-analysis. Some of them depend on objective and some of them depend on subjective research. Okay? But according to the last, uh, to the last uh, slide or research I, I, I uh, talked about, okay, it says that about two-thirds of people okay, improve by the end of the eighth okay, uh, week. And, and actually, okay, with this, uh, with this uh, result, okay, because, because I see many patients do not improve okay, uh, uh, after uh, one month okay, of the disease. So in my opinion, okay, about two-thirds of people improve completely by the end of, of two months after the disease, and about one of them, okay, one-third of people, okay, they still have some kind of refractory dysfunction. Uh, Dr. Abbasant, uh, we have here in the UK um, yeah, like is. protocol for the patient with loss of smell. Uh, the, in the first six weeks, um, of uh, the onset of loss of smell, uh, the patient should be seen only by GP and through phone consultation only. After six weeks, if the patient has isolated loss of smell, he may have steroid tablets or systemic injections together with omega-3 as well, but never give steroid in the first six weeks. And if the patient has any other symptoms of the nasal symptoms, we could just uh, request imaging like MRI 
but never do MRI for just isolated uh, loss of smell with a COVID patient only, unless he has a COVID negative. Yeah. Yeah, I think we, uh, in COVID-19 anosmia, okay, we see patients improve on steroids even after two months of the disease, which is fantastic, actually, for this virus. It's very, very strange. Yeah. Shukran, thank you. Uh, the coming question, uh, she, is, she is talking about the number of the healthcare worker affected during pandemic, and she is asking, uh, how can the surgery team reduce the length of the surgery? And uh, yani, uh, still, we can give the best and safe treatment, but how we can just reduce the length of the surgery so we can reduce the Yani, uh, uh, the time that we are going to be uh, encountered. Uh, here, uh, when we are just uh, doing surgery in the UK, uh, sometimes we are uh, doing the surgery and also we are not doing the reconstruction at the same time. So we have like two stage uh, surgery or we can doing like limited reconstruction like local flaps or um, some medical flab instead of uh, other like free flab or something like that. So we are just uh, doing briefing. So we are speaking with the anesthetist first and to other uh, staff team as well. Uh, that what we are planning to do in the surgery, uh, not to have any missing time during the surgery. Okay. Uh, anyone from the panelists want to add something? I can add, add, I, I can add about the. Um, we have we cannot decrease in, uh, the surgery for for any surgery, but we can sometimes customize the needed surgery from the unneeded surgery. So we, we can stop non-urgent surgeries and just go for urgent surgeries. I can comment on tracheostomies, for example. We um, we decided in Faqih to start doing the tracheostomies um, in the ICU as a bedside procedure rather than shifting the patient to the OR, which decreases the hazard of transferring a COVID-positive patient through the uh, corridors and to the uh, to the uh, to the OR, and also we uh, like uh, tried as much as we can to do it a per as percutaneous procedure rather than open procedure, because technically if, if if you do a tracheostomy and you're opening the trachea with a window in the trachea, then uh, there will be like uh, gushes of sputum or secretions uh, during the surgery. But if you're doing it percutaneously, most of the airways will be protected with the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, until the end of the procedure, till you just insert the tracheostomy. And also during that time, uh, there is like protocols to stop the ventilator and uh, don't do uh, ambu bagging while you're uh, inserting the, uh, the tracheostomy. So we can just customize the procedure, but not decrease the, the, the length of it. Just uh, one comment regarding the previous question. It's about the, um, the uh, healthcare worker and the numbers uh, affected. Unfortunately, we started to have more uh, more doctors and more nurses affected by by the COVID-19 in Jordan, um, and, and mainly they were uh, from ENT department, from uh, um, uh, emergency departments, but also some other specialties are also affected, like orthopedics. So it is um, uh, the um, the virus is there, and we have to be very careful. And um, unfortunately, we started to have um, uh, the healthcare workers started to to suffer a lot in, in Jordan. So um, be careful. Okay, thank you. So the coming question for Prof. Ferat uh, Zoghbi. Yesterday, uh, Fandem Dr. Mahmoud Bissal Hadratak, are you considered as a figure in coherent implants? What is the impact of COVID-19 in cholera implant okay. surgery? Okay. okay. Um, uh, to start with, uh, in, for regarding cochlear implant surgery, um, because of the pandemic, we didn't know what will, will happen after that. So the decision was, was taken not to do any cochlear implant surgery and to wait uh, uh, till the pandemic will ease a little bit. So for, for the first three months, no cochlear implant surgery. Uh, were allowed to be, to be done in, in Jordan, and um, gradually, because we don't want to uh, postpone the surgery because it has got a lot of effect and the outcome. If you uh, do cochlear implant surgery early in life, 
uh, the outcome will be will be uh, much better. So uh, we started to do very limited number of cochlear implant surgery in certain centers. Uh, there are some requirements for, for the center to do the cochlear implant surgery, uh, not to have any active cases inside the hospital, and um, uh, to have the follow-up and, and rehabilitation in a special, a special uh, clinic. So we resumed the cochlear implant surgery uh, because life will will continue. We can't, we can't stop everything. So um, and, and this is the advice for everything. Um, you can't stop everything. You can't stop um, the non-emergency uh, surgery forever. So, but when to start? So um, this is you have to weigh the pros and cons of, of any procedure before starting doing it. Okay, doctor. Thank you. Uh, the coming question, uh, he is asking about the rule of hyperbaric oxygen for restoring smell. Can I answer? The rule of hyperbaric oxygen. The yeah, there are from high studies mm -hmm. talking about this issue. Okay. But actually, it's, uh, it's, uh, the COVID-19 is a disease of, uh, of, of airway, okay? Of, it is, yes, it is. Uh, contact and to the aerosol, okay? But I, I don't think it's applicable, okay, to use uh, hyperbaric oxygen to patients who have loss of smell, okay? This costly and uh, which needs special rooms and spe special requirements in hospitals, okay? But there are a few uh, number of uh, uh, researchers and still talk about hyperbaric oxygen in, in COVID-19 patients, okay? The improvement, Yani? Uh, most of, the, uh, of these studies, okay, uh, there are few number of studies, okay. The actual improvement, it, it is not well established. It is not evidence-based. Okay. Um, my master's degree is in hyperbaric oxygen, so I just want to add something. Um, hyperbaric oxygen can give some results uh, for the patient, but the problem is the percentage is not high. It's like uh, 10 to 20 percent. But when I came here to the UK, they are not considering hyperbaric oxygen for any patient for sudden hearing loss or anosmia. So um, according to the study in Egypt, it's working well, but here in the UK, they are not considering at all. You don't no have evidence base. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shukran, doctor. Thank you. The, the last question, uh, he is asking, uh, which is uh, more frequent uh, central uh, respiratory failure or failure due to pneumonia? No, yani which one is more frequent? Yeah, of course, failure of pneumonia, of course. Because this is, this is a research issue, central. The central cause of respiratory failure is a research issue. But of course, it is very proved that it's peripheral and because of the severe pneumonia and respiratory, and respiratory issue, for, for sure. Any any other addition from our panelists? I, I think yeah, um, as as uh, uh, there are mentioned, it is uh, it is a local uh, um, uh, lung issue with uh, secretion and and uh, and fibrosis sometimes. Sure, So finally, I just want to thank all our respected, uh, very eminent speaker. And I want to thank the, the one person behind all this uh, uh, good gathering. He is the one already brought from every garden one flower, Dr. Ibrahim. Really, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim, for uh, your coordination and preparing for the webinar. Without you and your efforts, we, we couldn't have uh, such webinar uh, tonight. Shukran, thank you for our very eminent, respected speaker, for your preparation, cooperation. And I know that I bothered you every now and then, asking that uh, two minutes only, two minutes only, but I just want to uh, maintain yani, the time for the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very and much. Your and your response, I highly appreciate it. Thank you. Shukran. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Bassan. Thank, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, missing you, Dr. Hassam. Shukran, Yifanda. Thank you very much, and I want to thank our dear colleagues, the attendees. Uh, you added value to our webinar tonight. And let me highlight the point that I told you that I will highlight from the beginning, that the attendance today or the target audience who is going to get CME point or continuous medical education point from Saudi Council is physician, pharmacist, and nursing. Uh, I have here one question that he is asking or she is asking about certificate. 
ان شاء الله اور اي تي دي ار وركينج ناو فور ديفلوبينج ا نيو اي ليرنينج موديول وي هاد بيفور وان اي ليرنينج موديول بس بيكوز وي هاف ذيس ولا وي هاد ذيس فيزيكال ليكشرز ناو وي هاف تو كومباين ذيس اي ليرنينج موديول وذ ذا فيرتشوال ستريمينج فجست بي بيشنت وذ اس اند ان شاء الله وي ار جوينج تو سند اتندنس سيرتيفيكت فور افري سنجل اتندي Till we will meet again because inshallah we have a very interesting coming webinar in the uh, coming weeks. I'm going just to invite you for the pediatric webinar which will be in uh, inshallah Wednesday, uh, 21st of October and the ICU webinar will be 27th of October. Till I will see you inshallah in the coming webinar. Wish you all to be in a very safe and to be careful. Take care from the second wave. Inshallah everything will be okay. Shukran ya jama'a. Wish you very nice evening and good uh, weekend for those that they are having still tomorrow weekend. Okay? Shukran, Yagama. Zvala khair. Thank you. 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 شكرا جزيلا جميعا بخص الذكر الجماعه اللي يعني بجوز اوفر ذا سيز من بريطانيا وبامريكا دكتور احمد ودكتور محمود شكرا جزيلا لحضوركم وبجوز هالوقت ما بعرف الوقت مناسب اصلا لمحاضرتكم بجوز عندكم دوام شكرا للدكتور فراس الزعبي والدكتور حسام العمودي بجوز ما بعرف اذا بتعرفوا بعض قبل هيك او لا بوث اوف يو ار ويل نون اوتولوجيست ان شاء الله في بتصير الايام بتصير السفر سهل وبنصير نقدر نلاقيكم مع بعض وراح يكون في اجتماع مفيد ان شاء الله رب العالمين. شكرا دكتور احمد ابو سعود شكرا جزيلا لحضورك معنا وبتمنى اتعرف عليك عن قرب كمان ان شاء الله رب العالمين. شكرا لك الله يعطيك العافيه. شكرا لك السلام عليكم.